This month, Beverly Head has been looking at the indigenous IT industry. Bev, what's our industry like? Well, it's niche-based and, unfortunately, in many quarters is starved of funds, sending many inventions offshore, which seems a strange way to achieve the government's goal of a clever country. Still, there are some bright spots. It's not just yachts that sail under that bridge. Increasingly, it's computer exports. During the last financial year, exports of $831 million were registered, a record which is helping to narrow the trade imbalance. But we still import more than $3.6 billion worth of computers and services every year. Of course, you can argue about how Australian the imports are anyway. IBM will tell you its exports are Australian, and they are in a way. But IBM does often pay a dividend to its American parent, which also controls intellectual property. What the multinationals are doing, though, and this shouldn't be underrated, is to provide an infrastructure in which Australian companies can develop. Many large companies have joined the government's Partners for Development scheme or face some form of offsets obligation. For them, it's often easier to leverage this through local firms by farming out manufacture, research and development or exports. Even the largest Australian companies couldn't exist without foreign multinationals for the simple reason that there isn't a single top-tier computer maker which is Australian. All our computers are derived from American, European or Asian designs. Paxus, based in North Sydney, is an Australian company which has grown to a revenue of $200 million and is one of the world's two major insurance software specialists. Neil Cullimore is managing director. Neil, what are the barriers that a company like Paxus faces, both here and abroad, with being an Australian company? Well, the first, and I think probably the most significant barrier, uh, is the lack of capital in Australia. Uh, and I think that that affects the industry, or perhaps I should say more specifically the product companies in the industry. Would you say that Australian companies are willing to give Australian computer companies a fair hearing when it comes to their technology? Uh, well, I think that they're prepared to give Australian companies a hearing. I don't believe that they're prepared to put an Australian company ahead of, a, uh, of an overseas company. I think that they're, and I should say I believe rightfully, are more concerned about the impact of IT on their particular companies. And if the local industry is unable to provide the appropriate solution, then I see no reason why they should have to select an Australian supplier if it has a negative or perhaps not such a positive impact on the business as any, in any other supplier. Whatever Paxis's experience, the fact is that big business isn't philanthropic. It can't afford to be. If Australian technology is world class, competitively priced and has some runs on the board, then big business might give it a whirl. The only time Australian technology gets a slightly easier run is when it's being sold to government. And there are some programs in place to try to encourage government departments to try local technology. But no Australian company can rely on this leg up for too long. Computer Power has had its leg up, winning the prime contracting business for the $1 billion tax office computer revamp. But its continuing financial struggles indicate that government contracts alone don't guarantee success. And Computer Sciences of Australia, which has done a lot of work for the Defence Department and its parent AMP, looks as though it's about to be sold to the Americans. So, is being Australian really important anymore? Should we worry about having our own IT industry? It may be desirable in the sense that as Australians we all would like to see the farm remain owned at home, but it may not be realistic for us to assume that that will always be the case, be it the IT industry tourism or any number of other industries. Is it possible for IT companies to survive on their own anymore, just as Australian owned? It's looking doubtful, I think. We used to think that that was going to be possible, but realistically I think all of us have come to recognise it's going to be difficult, number one, to build from where we are, and point number two, there are of course no inhibitors in a real sense, to the major transnationals coming and setting up here and, if you will, buying market share uh, or taking market share from us. There are no real inhibitors to some of the other transnationals who are not present today uh, deciding to do that. A strong local IT industry does matter. 
without a local infrastructure, future generations will be completely hostage to overseas innovation. We won't be so much a clever country as cheap labour for the multinationals. Already, many Australian inventions are owned by overseas companies. For example, Ramtron's ferroelectronic memory technology is about to be sold to the US. SDI, the inventor of Netmaster, which is a strong communications rival for IBM products, is now owned by the US-based System Center. But it's not all gloom. Some products are Australian and doing very well, thank you. Perth's QPSX has developed a metropolitan area networking system, which is being adopted as a world standard. Another communications company faring well here is Netcom, which has exported modems to Apple and is now selling one of the world's first PCMCIA modem cards for portable computing. Chris, Netcom has succeeded with exports and the local market. What has this company got that others don't? Th thanks for the compliment. I, I think we are conscious of the fact that our exports are making slow progress over a long period of time, but they're nowhere near as good as we'd like them to be. Um, and uh, I guess one of the things that we do a bit differently is perhaps we have a slightly longer term point of view than a lot of other companies. Do you think Australians are prepared to give Netcom an Australian company a go or do they favour the multinationals? We've, we've taken a pretty outspoken view about particularly government support but I think on balance we get a, a, a very reasonable hearing from the government. We get a great deal of support from a large number of government departments and private Australia are, are big buyers of our products. So we're very thankful for that and, and I hope the criticisms that have been put forward are seen more as constructive recommendations for other people who may be trying to follow behind us. Unfortunately, other companies with equally good technology are finding it hard to raise the capital necessary to take them to the next stage. Syrinx Systems has developed voice synthesis and recognition chips which have attracted interest from OTC and from Apple but it's finding it almost impossible to find the capital needed to develop and further the technology. Dr. Clive Summerfield is the firm's principal. Clive, for a start-up company with a good idea, is Australia a good place to be? Uh, not really. W why, why do you say <laughs> that? Oh, it's, um, the market's small. It's extremely difficult to um, um, acquire finance to bring uh, good ideas through, uh, through to the market, through to commercial realisation and um, we're in many ways a long way from where the real action is which is uh, naturally in um, uh, America and in, in Europe. Where have you looked for finance and what problems have you come up against? Well in, in our industry um, we are principally uh, interested in equity finance, equity style finance and uh, we've principally looked at the venture capital organisations of which there are only a handful in Australia. If you can't fund the development, what happens to the technology? The technology has a very limited life cycle. Um, if you cannot fund the technology, it will, it will just naturally um, degrade, if you like, and become valueless. It's a sad fact that many great ideas are sold overseas because there isn't the will or the capital to invest in them here. It's often a case of ignorance on the investment community's part. After a brief flirtation with high tech in the mid-1980s, it's once again become a dirty word associated with high risk. Some companies survive and thrive. Companies such as Brisbane's Mincom, which has created software solutions for resource companies. ISR Holdings, with its haste tools, is developing a strong following in Japan. Grapevine, a groupware system, is attracting interest for its developers at Office Express from companies as big as Microsoft. South Australia's LabTAM is internationally lauded for its X-terminal range. The common thread seems to be finding a niche. As developers of mainstream computer technologies, we've had little success and arguably had little future. There have been attempts to foster IT investment in business parks and technology incubators such as those in South Australia and at Bond University. But so far, Australia hasn't found its silicon billabong. Even the multifunction polis proposal and the South Australian information utility seem to be fiddling attempts rather than a wholehearted attack on the problem. Support for Australian technology is patchy. The government has a rather limp-wristed, buy local, but only if you want to policy.
It's obsessed by level playing fields and free trade. Marquis of Queensbury rules when the rest of the world is populated by street fighters. If only a tiny proportion of the massing superannuation funds in this country were directed at the high-tech industry, Australia could develop a vigorous and strong indigenous IT sector. But for the present at least, Australia's high-tech Davids are on their own against the international Goliaths. Mm, thanks very much, Bev.